Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are um, very, very honored to be here. I know that Tara has um, made it a, a, a part of her a leadership of the chamber to have this program for the last several years. And I know that um, the three of us are very honored to be able to be invited to participate to give an update on legislative issues to the North Augusta Chamber and the North Augusta are you community. Are you on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Might need to slide that up. Yeah, you're in. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. All right, so we put together a PowerPoint. We're going to run through this. There are several things in here that we think are of interest to the citizens in this part of the state and in the districts that we represent. And there are things in that, that, um, that we, frankly, there's, there's so much stuff that we could have put in here. Um, and we know that we've got a sort of a time frame we got um, to try to cover this in. So we're going to run through this. And um, if, if people have questions, uh, we will be here afterwards for questions, and I think that uh, Tara will allow some questions at the end if we have time. Is that, is that fair? Okay. All right. So anyway, my name is Tom Young, and I represent Senate District 24. I'm the chairman of the Aiken County Legislative Delegation. And I'm Shane Massey. I represent District 25, which is, I've got portions of Aiken, Edgefield, Lexington, McCormick, and Saluda counties. I'm Bill Hickson. Uh, I represent House District 83. I've got parts of Bacon County and parts of Edgefield County. First thing we want to tell you is that we appreciate the opportunity that we've been given by the citizens of the respective districts that we represent for the opportunity and the privilege to serve in the South Carolina General Assembly. We each have an email update that we send out. Some of you are on all three of our lists. Some of you are not on any of our lists. But if you would like to be on our list, and if you would give us your email address or send it to us, then we'll make sure we add you to our list. Now, I've got my contact information on this card. I'll start passing them around. And I know they, they've got some, too. Um, so just let us know your email address, and we'll put you on our list. If, if you want to do it the easier way for me, my name is BillHickson.com. You can go to my webpage and sign up to get my uh, letters. I don't send them quite as frequently as some people do. I send them when we're in session and, and if something's really going on, I send mine out there. All right, so uh, first of all, th this is one of those times when Tom and I are thankful for four-year terms. Uh, because we're not up next year. The, uh, the, Senate, the entire Senate is up every four years, and we're up during presidential years. Uh, so the Senate will be up in 2000. Right now, we have really 45 members because we have one suspension uh, that you've probably heard about. Senator John Corson of Columbia is suspended right now. The interesting thing that I want to point out about this, though, is that middle, the middle dot. A lot of people don't realize this. We've had a tremendous amount of turnover in the state Senate in just the last five years. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the, uh, the, the majority leader, half, over half of the Republicans in the Senate have five years or less experience. That's a, that's a big change. And if you see also the eight, eight Democrats in the last five years. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of new stuff coming in to the Senate, which I think is a good thing. Thank you, Linda, talking about the House. Uh, on the House, we have, uh, when we pull, we have 124 members. But as you can see right now, we have 122 currently. Uh, we have two members that have resigned. We also have two members that uh, are under suspension. Uh, but, and we serve two-year terms. Uh, in the House, uh, when we pull, in the past, we had 80 Republicans and 44 Democrats. Okay, we want to talk just briefly about the VC Summer Nuclear Project. How many people in here have not heard about this in the last two weeks? <laughs> Nobody raised their hand, so this is on the top of a lot of people's uh, minds. Anyway, on July 31st, two and a half weeks ago, Sandy Cooper and SCG announced that they were going to discontinue the project. It is a uh, nuclear power project in Jenkinsville, South Carolina, which is in uh, Fairfield County. It started, construction started in 2012. Um, there are over 5,000 jobs that are impacted. Um, there have been nine rate increases by SC&G to help pay for it. 
in five by Santee Cooper for their customers since 2008 to help pay for the Santee Cooper portion. All of that was allowed under the 2007 Base Load Review Act. None of the three of us were in the General Assembly in 2007 when that legislation passed. That's an important point. None of us put it <laughs> Now, two weeks ago, both companies not only announced that they were going to withdraw, meet or to suspend the project, but they each filed with the Public Service Commission um, a rate increase request. And both companies have now withdrawn their most recent rate increase request, most recently was SNG on Tuesday of this week. Everything is on the table in terms of what the state needs to do to possibly restart the project, to protect ratepayers, and to reform the law. Um, there's a legislative review and reform process that has already started. Next Tuesday, the Senate panel that's been um, established with Senator Massey on it is going to start hearings on uh, next Tuesday, August 22nd at 11 a.m. It'll be live streamed um, via the South Carolina State House uh, website. And on Wednesday, I think it's Representative Hickson is on the House Committee and they're meeting on Wednesday. Yes, sir. And that'll be live streamed on Wednesday. So the bottom line is I think that our legislative delegation, everybody on our county delegation, including the three of us, agree that we've got to protect ratepayers and ensure the situation like this does not happen again. Senator, we have uh, another House member, Mark Blackwood. He's going to be on that uh, committee in the House, too. He's, uh, he's another one of my delegation members. Right. Bart is, um, represents part of uh, South Aiken, Granville, and Warrenville in the South Carolina House. Now, Roads, the road with the next four or five slides are on the roads bill that passed earlier this year. And um, I'll let one of y'all talk a little bit about that. I, I voted for it, so I'll talk about it. Um, we passed, it was a massive bill, uh, and, and basically uh, when I talk to people at church or meetings like this, I ask my friends, I said, how do you like living in 2017? Most everybody likes it. I said, how would you like to go back to a 1987 income and live in 2017? No one I ever talked to liked that. So this is one of the reasons I, I voted for uh, to try to fix our roads. Uh, the two cents, first two cents has already been implemented. And you can see when the second two cents and then it goes down, uh, we're going to have 12 cents total when it would be up. And so it'll be 28.75 cents when the fully it be fully implemented in 20, 2022. We've got some extra numbers there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I vote. I vote. Um, and, and basically, we've been forever, when you look in here, if you buy a car, a bus, or jet airplane, or anything in South Carolina, it was going to be $300 sales tax. Now we're going to five hundred dollars. For the folks that live in Georgia, normally y'all pay seven or eight percent on what the cost of the vehicle is. I was have been at three hundred dollars. Now we're going to five hundred dollars, and then would be an increase of sixteen hundred dollars. I mean, sixteen dollars, sixteen dollars for your registration fee. Uh, and then also we place a six dollar biannual fee on hybrid vehicles and one hundred twenty dollars on electric vehicles. Those are the vehicles that don't buy any gas to speak of a whole lot. And they're traveling our same roads and wearing out the same roads that we're traveling, but we buy gas and that money goes towards the roads and bridges. Uh, this was something that the speaker found. Uh, he, was, uh, he moved his son to North Carolina. And North Carolina had this as far as if you move and enter that state, they would charge you $250, but I think North Carolina was $350 to register your vehicle in our state. The other one is, uh, in other words, in the end of six years, it's supposed to be $620 million of new dollars that we're gonna be going to roads and bridges. Okay. I don't wanna pay I'll give you a break. Oh, that's I, fine. Yeah. The, if, we get a lot of questions about this. This slide's important, right? Because we get a lot of questions about what's this money gonna to go to, it's gonna to go to this, it's gonna to go to that. There's actually specific language in the legislation that passed that says that we're creating a new fund, um, this infrastructure maintenance trust fund. Every dollar that's raised pursuant to this is going into that fund, except for um, a little bit that's coming out for the Education Improvement Act. 
Um, and that's only because there's existing law that says part of the sales tax revenue goes to education. And, and since we're raising some stuff, we wanted to make sure we kept that whole. Uh, but the money, the money that's being raised is going specifically to maintenance and repair of the existing roadway system. Right? It's not going to be used to build new roads. Um, it's going to be used to repair and maintain what we've got. There were some other parts to the bill too, um, and there's been a lot of, well, there's been some criticism of this part, but this is uh, this is another part that was in there. This really has nothing at all to do with roads. This had to do with, um, this is about getting votes, what this part was. Uh, <laughs> but well, what you got, the first, the first bullet point is something that you've probably heard about, and that is it includes a rebate um, for the amount of money that's kind of complicated. But it's a rebate for the amount of money that we pay in increased gas tax collections, but by how much we spend on preventative maintenance for our vehicles. Uh, and that, though, phases out as soon as the full, full 12 cents is phased in. So that expires in six years. But for the next six years, you can get a credit, a state income tax credit. Even if you, even if you don't have any, any income to file, you can still file the tax return and get a credit for what you spend on preventative maintenance up to the amount of money that you spent on increased gas tax. Makes sense, right? Clear, clear enough? <laughs> <laughs> There's also, um, we have, we actually, we've had in South Carolina for a good while income, uh, income tuition tax credits. Um, so if, you, if you've got children in, in higher education, you may know about this. Of course, lots of time, because of the life scholarships and the lottery fund scholarships, people don't qualify for these things. But we do have these income tuition tax credits. We've increased that to $1,500, not only for four-year schools, but also for the technical colleges as well. I'll go ahead and press uh, We also created, for the first time in South Carolina, a state-based earned income tax credit. Um, we increased our two-wage earner tax credit, which is essentially South Carolina's version of the earned income tax credit, but, but it requires two wage earners as opposed to the EITC can apply to just one. Um, but we're, we're increasing that as well. And then the last point on there is probably if, if you talk to people in, in, in industry, they will tell you that the, the one tax rate that we have that is way out of line with any other state is the tax that we charge on industrial property. Uh, it's at 10.5%. Now, for the larger employers, for Bridgestone, they don't have to worry about that because they can negotiate a deal with counties on those type of things. A lot of the smaller folks can. So they get stuck at 10.5%. That's way higher than anybody any, anywhere near us. So what we're doing is we're lowering that incrementally down to 9% over a six-year period. How much longer? <laughs> Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of you want to talk about. All right, so then, but also with the bill is it allows the governor to remove SCDOT commissioners at will um, and as a ninth at large SCDOT commissioner appointment for the governor. Currently, there's eight and an even number. This adds a nine as a ninth commission um, seat. It prohibits the DOT commissioners from being involved in this. I couldn't believe this wasn't already involved this middle point. Yeah. But it prohibits them from being able to be involved in decisions to award contracts and select project routes where they actually have an interest until one year after they've left the commission. And it requires the DOT to develop a transportation asset management plan to address rural roads. And they actually have already started that process. And they've identified rural roads that um, that are actually in, in, in many, many counties across the state, including Aiken and Edgefield County, that are going to be um, provided um, with improvements, whether they be intersection improvements or, or shoulder improvements, paving improvements. Um, yes, sir. Well, what I was going to say is many people sent me emails about who won't reform the DOT. This is reform. The governor appoints them all. He can remove them all. And prior to this, it was who the Secretary of Transportation, who, who, who does she work for? Or he, the governor or the commission? Now the commission is going to elect the Secretary of Transportation. So the Secretary of Transportation is going to work for the commission, for, for the uh, commissioners. It was so confusing. And, and she told us that, you know, she was appointed by the governor, and but she has to answer to the commission and the governor. So it was like, who's my boss? 
it has been reformed, and, and this is one of the biggest things that I, I like about it. So uh, the, the governor is, is, is the sole responsibility. And so we're gonna look at him or her, whoever our governor is, and say, okay, what you gonna do? I, 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 that's one, I think that's one of the best parts of the bill, um, is everybody knows who's running the show now. It's the governor. Right. Um, all right, so we've been getting a good bit of questions, and y'all probably deal with this some, because I know you go across the river a good bit, right? Um, Real ID has had a lot of attention over the last the last couple of years, but it's really picked up in the last several months. Let me just cut to the chase and say this. We passed legislation this spring to comply with Real ID. We've been given an extension through next year. Y'all going to be fine. All right, so you're going to be able to get on an airplane, you're going to be able to go to Fort, Fort Gordon, you're going to be able to do whatever. Um, we're going to be fine, and, and DMV is actually starting the process now of, being, of collecting information, and then they're also getting the process in place in order to issue the new driver's license. If you don't want one, you don't have to get one, but if you want one, you're going to have that opportunity. We're going to be fine. Everybody good with that? All right. Can I speak for yeah, you? Yeah, all right. um, most of y'all know I just got married in October. My wife lives in Georgia. Uh, when we got married, I told her, Please move over to South Carolina. She did. <laughs> but, but, but uh, yeah, she can vote for me. Yeah. So, but, but I, I got criticized because when she moved from Georgia to South Carolina, prior to her, her, her moving over here, she had a Georgia driving license and it had a star on it at the top right corner. She was already a Homeland Security certified. She moves to South Carolina and she had to give that up. But. Let me tell you, I went up and met with uh, Colonel Swago, who was head of DMV, and also I went up and met with the staff up at the North Augusta location. And they gave me some paperwork. Uh, it, it, it's, you gotta have two proofs of a South Carolina address. You gotta have proof of US citizenship, uh, including a birth certificate or your passport or something like that. Uh, legal documentation supporting a name change. My wife had to show the birth certificate. She had to show that she got married. Her husband died. She had to show a death certificate, and then she had to show unreal that she married me. And and, and so she had to show all that. So it, 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 it's not it, it is it, it, it's going to be worked out, but it's a process. And bear with them and bear with us because uh, I got a call uh, a few months ago from a gentleman that has 16 employees that goes to Fort Gordon every day. And, they, and at that time, they were going to deny his driving license, their driving licenses. But we got that changed and we got back in the system where we could extend it. So it, it's gonna be a process that you have to go through. I'm one of the guys that's got a license that's gonna come up in uh, mm -hmm. September. Mm -hmm. I can't get a certified uh, Homeland Security ID yet. But they're going to put my stuff on file, and when they get it ready to go, I can go back in, and they'll have all my stuff on file, and, and they will issue us one. It, it, it's, it's bare with them because they ask a lot, but, but this is what Homeland Security is requiring us to do. It's not the state of South Carolina. And if, you, look, if you've got children or grandchildren who've gotten the driver's license in the last five or six years, they've already gone through this process, right? We've been collecting this information for the last five, six, seven years. <laughs> But for most of us in the room, we haven't had to submit this information um, to DMV when people. We got our license initially. So all of us are going to have to do that if you want that ID. Now, if you don't want it, you don't have to go through all that process. Um, but yeah. we're going to be okay. So the key point is you, you do not need a real ID if you know you will not be boarding a commercial airline flight or visiting a secure federal facility or military base. You don't need a real ID to drive, to vote, to apply for or receive federal benefits, to enter a federal facility like a post office that does not require an ID to enter, to access a hospital or receive life safety services, or participate in law enforcement proceedings or investigations, including serving on a federal jury in a federal courthouse. So if, it, if you work at the Savannah River site, if you work at Fort Gordon, if you visit those places, um, or anywhere like that, or if you plan on flying on an airplane um, for a commercial airline, not a private plane, but a commercial airline flight, then you're going to have to have a real ID. And the date or passport that, that, that's important is October 1, 2020. October 1, 2020. So 
Um, that's the key date according to Colonel Schwedo from the South Carolina Department of Motor Vehicles. So South Carolina cannot issue these IDs yet, but they are telling us that they will be able to issue the IDs sometime later this fall, but certainly by the beginning of the year. It will be in the it'll be in our emails that we send out about when they're doing it, uh, when, when they start to do it. It'll be in the press. I'm sure it'll be on Channel Six, um, the AP Standard, North Augusta Star, um, Augusta Chronicle, and you know, when South Carolina DMV can start issuing them. Um, and this is what um, Representative Hickson was saying earlier. If you want to get one, you can go ahead and start bringing your stuff to the DMV office, and they'll scan it. And this is what Senator Massey was saying. They've actually already gathered this stuff if you've gone to get an, an ID in the last few years they, they've already got this stuff supposedly online or on file for you in their system um, any questions about real ID yes sir do you have if you've got a military ID do you still have to provide all that information yeah the, if you have a military ID that's not a um, the questions come up several times if you have a passport can you just give them your passport and the answer is that the federal government the rules that we have to follow and that Georgia has to follow you can't just give them your passport and I assume the same would apply with your military ID it doesn't make any sense to me but that's kind of that was what we were told yes will the real ID serve also as a substitute for the passport eventually no no, I, I don't know about eventually, but currently it, it will not. But if it's a real ID, it won't get you in another country. Right, good point. A real ID will not get you into another country. You don't have to have a passport. Uh, the question is whether you can get back. Yeah, he, you can go, but you might not get back, right? <laughs> Call us. All right, we'll move on to education. Just real quick, um, the base student cost, um, which the, um, has been a uh, topic of discussion for several years now. The state increased the base student cost to each school district from 2350 to 2425, um, which, which cost us $60 million statewide to do that. Um, the Education Finance Act and other funding sources collectively for, for public education in South Carolina, K through 12, totals over $2.5 billion in the current state budget, which started July 1. There's 28, almost $29 million for new school buses. The governor vetoed, veto 23 was um, a veto of 17 million of that 28.9 million. So currently part of that money is vetoed. I would fully expect the legislature to override that veto when we do go back in session, which I think will be in January to take up that veto. Um, and then there's, some people take advantage of the exceptional needs tax credit program, which started I think three years ago. And we increased that by another million dollars to an eleven million dollar allotment in the state. Can I say something about school buses? Yes, sir. I got a lot of calls and a lot of emails about school buses. Uh, whenever the governor sends out his veto list, he puts a letter in there saying why he's going to veto it. Uncertainty of funds is one of the things that he brought up about why he wasn't going to do it. Also, in that same letter, it says lottery funds on claim. Once a lottery ticket expires or whatever and it, and it reaches a deadline that you can never claim the money, lottery funds unclaimed is lottery funds unclaimed. You can never go back and claim them again. That was some of the money that we, we were going to put in there to buy school buses. I mean, nothing more important than to get your kids back and forth to school on nice buses. Uh, based on talking to some of my house members, uh, the house is going to override that veto pretty fast. State retirement system. <laughs> you work on that hard time. Yeah. yeah. This is um this son's been in the news a good bit. You probably heard about this. Um, especially if you're um, a state or local employee uh, or, or affiliated with state or local government. Um, so we've had some issues in the past, but well, we still do with uh, with our retirement accounts and whether we're gonna be able to pay off everything. Now, I think we're going to be able to pay off there, um, but we had to make some changes in order to ensure the, the solvency of things. And we made those changes. South Carolina has five retirement accounts. Don't ask me why. I don't know. We have five retirement accounts. 
The biggest one, of course, is the South Carolina retirement system, which is what most state employees, most local government employees, most teachers are in. Uh, we also have a specific account for police officers, that's the PORS. Um, law enforcement is in that one. Both of those are the two that if we were having trouble, it was going to be those two. So those are the ones that we had to make changes to. Um, and, and basically what we did is we raised, we raised the contribution rates, which if you're an employee, you already know that, right? Um, and, and if you're affiliated with local government, you also know that we raised those rates because we raised the rates for employee contributions, but also for the employer contributions. And there's a cap that's going to be on the employee contributions. Now, just to put all this in perspective just a little bit, for the, um, for the, for the main retirement system, when all this is phased in, the combined total contribution is going to be about 28% of the South. Right? I'll think about that. Does anybody say 28%? If you are, tell me how you're doing. Right? For police officers, the total combined savings is going to be 33% of their salary. That gives you an idea of how far behind we were and how, how much we got to do in order to catch up. That once this is phased in, we're going to be saving a significant amount in order to meet financial obligations that are there. Uh, we also adjusted the, the assumed rate of return, which has a big impact on, on cost of living adjustments and everything along those lines. Um, is there another part to this one? This is the only slide. This is the only slide. Um, so it, it, it was a pretty complicated issue, uh, and it took us a while to get it done. We had some study committees that actually worked really well. But this was phase one. We've got another phase, hopefully, that's going to come and talks more about the structure of the retirement system. Um, look, there's going to be a lot of conversation about whether we're going to be able to sustain a pension type system for a long time into the future. And there's going to be a lot of people who want to move into the more 401k type system as opposed to just a pure pension type system or some type of a higher. You're going to be hearing more about that in the next legislative session. We'll talk about that a little Yeah, that's my bill. <laughs> Uh, highway Worker Safety Zone. Uh, as all y'all know, we had uh, two DOT workers killed in Aiken County uh, a few months ago. Um, and the uh, Secretary of Transportation came to me and she said, will you sponsor a bill? And we call it the Highway Worker Safety Zone. Prior to that, they called it Peanuts Law. Uh, there was a highway uh, worker that was named Peanut that was killed a few years ago way down in the low part of the state. And so, um, what this does is, our state for years had, had had the work zones, but they're not really enforcing the work zones as far as the increased fines and fees if you were caught speeding in the work zones. And basically what this does, it sets up a work zone, and it describes the work zone, and it's got to be somebody working in the work zone, uh, and it won't, should not be a speed trap. But also part of this money that's raised off of the uh, fees or fines that are given there in those work zones, it goes back, some of it to uh, DPS to hire off-duty highway patrolmen to sit in these work zones with blue lights. Nothing gets my attention any faster than a set of blue lights, especially when they're behind me. Uh, but, but if I'm approaching some blue lights, it makes you know that, that you need to have caution up there. So this is going to be able to hire a uh, policeman sheriffs uh, and highway patrolmen to be able to work these work zones and get paid to work there to protect our workers. And it was it was pretty hard sale uh, as far as in the house, but we uh, got people that want to make sure it's defined what a worker is and what a work zone is and how it's got to be signed properly as far as signage. Uh, and, and so we got it worked out and got to the Senate and we did some hard work over there and, and these guys helped us get it through. But uh, uh, I was proud uh, when she came to me and asked me to do that, and uh, I didn't realize it was going to be that hard. But anyway, we got it done, and uh, these gentlemen helped me uh, along with our rest of our delegation. And she came uh, a few months ago and signed a bill with the governor over in the Aiken, one of the Aiken DOT sheds over there. So it, it's it's to protect our workers, and it defines a work zone, which we didn't have. Before. This one falls into the category that this should not be as hard. Right. I mean, this was way harder to get past than it should have, but it, but it was it was important. You want to talk about the real estate? I do that. Dude. You want to talk about real estate? Yeah, the, uh, real, the the real estate bill that we passed. That all y'all remember reading about uh, what happened up in Spartanburg, up a part of the uh, South Carolina, about the old, that realtor that abducted a lady and had her in this tractor trailer, and anyway, it was a mess. But 
we were trying to say, well, how do you get a real estate license? So we firmed up what it takes to get a real estate license. And now we're going to have to be going through a fingerprint process. We're going to go through a very hard criminal background check for somebody to be able to get a real estate license. Because that person had one, and, and prior to that, it was sort of lax on what it would have to do to be able to get a real estate license. And also, it's going to affect us in insurance, too. We're having to do that, too. We're having to do fingerprinting, too. But anyway, that was a, a, a really one of the deals that was a no-nonsense kind of deal we needed, should have been passed a long time ago. Other states were already doing it. We weren't doing it. Yeah, the guy that, 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 that Representative Hicks is talking about, um, who was a Spartanburg real estate agent, had a prior criminal record, pretty substantial criminal record, had done prison time, and then got licensed here in South Carolina as a realtor, and he kidnapped one of his customers, and she was found, you know, weeks later in this uh, uh, storage container. And so fortunately, she, she survived, but... Um, yeah, I think they, they found two or three people that he had killed and buried on his property, too. Yeah, it's terrible. Anyway, the Freedom of Information Act bill, um, this was championed by um, Representative Bill Taylor, who's on our legislative delegation, along with um, Weston Newton um, in, from down in the Bluffton area in the House. Um, but it finally got uh, passed. This, this bill's been hanging around the General Assembly for probably six or seven years. It and um, every, you know, it's, it would get through the House, it wouldn't get anywhere in the Senate, and eventually it, it made its way through the Senate last year. Um, in 2016, it got all the way to the to the very end, and uh, we had one senator from Lawrenceboro who um, did everything she could to torpedo it. And she delayed it another year, but it got enacted this year. The governor signed into law, and so it it, it, will, it what it does is it, it um, makes it uh, where if you as a citizen want to find out information about local government, state government. Um, then you can request it under the Freedom of Information Act. It strengthens the ability that you have as a citizen to find out the information. Um, and if you want to know more about it, I can tell you after the meeting. Also, we passed the uh, mandatory liability insurance. If you, if you are an establishment that serves alcohol, um, then you have to have liability insurance coverage in order to have your uh, license to sell alcohol. These are some actual, um, just real quick, we want to run through these with you. This is some good good information to know. These are based on 2016 numbers from the Department of Commerce. But last year, we had 12,366 jobs that were announced in South Carolina through economic development um, announcements. Those capital investments were $3.4 billion. Um, there was 118 total projects that were announced across the state. More than half of those were in the manufacturing sector. And we are currently the home to three automotive original equipment manufacturers, including Volvo, Mercedes-Benz, and BMW. Um, we are also home to four of the top ten global tire manufacturers, including Bridgestone, which is here in Aiken County. And we're so fortunate to have Bridgestone, not with one plant, but two, as, as they told us this morning before we started. And collectively across the state, the tire manufacturers who are located here produce more than 100,000 tires a day. We make more tires in South Carolina than any other state in the country. How many people knew that? Raise your hand. Some of you know, most of you didn't know that. We make more tires than any other state in the nation on a daily basis right here in South Carolina. From 2011 to 2016, manufacturing employment grew 16.9%, which is the top number in the Southeast. And our exports through the, um, primarily through the Port of Charleston exceed $31 billion a year. It's a lot of stuff going through the Port of Charleston. And I saw two days ago the Port of Charleston for the month of July 2017 had its biggest month ever on record for, uh, or I should say the biggest July ever on record um, at the port. So we're anticipating that 2017 could exceed 2016 numbers for exports. Yeah, so looking forward to next year, you know, there's going to be a lot of things happening between now and January, so there'll be some things added to the list that we don't even know about probably yet. But of course, the Base Load Review Act is getting all the attention right now, and it probably should. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of other things that will come up as well, uh, and I won't read them all to you, uh, but, but, but I will tell you that I do think that there's going to be a lot of time focusing in the legislature on workforce development. 
you go back to the previous couple slides about how successful that we have been with economic development with the industrial recruitment in the last five, six years. We're going to have to do a better job going forward of making sure that people have the opportunities to get the skills and training they need to compete for those jobs. Uh, and, and so there's going to be a bigger focus than, than what we've had. Lots of other things that are going to be, be coming up. I don't know if you guys want to talk about any of them specifically. Um, but, and then I'm sure there'll be other things that are not. Can I just ask a question? You see a bond bill. A bond bill is where the state of South Carolina would put out uh, a bid and sell bonds. Uh, the bond bill that I got a glance at last year, or this year, before we adjourned, um, affects a lot of schools. It's like when the University of South Carolina Aiken, I don't know if anybody's here from them, but we, we, we were looking at that pretty hard. They got hit real hard during the freeze. Also, they have a building over there that's one of the original buildings uh, that was there. Um, what's the name of the bond bill? Uh, the Pen 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 Pendulum building. Uh, it's the original building. Um, with money being tight, as far as in their budget, uh, and tuition trying to keep it down low, really the only way they will be able to fix something like that would be through a bond bill. Uh, we met with the chancellor and she showed us a video of it. Some of us have toured it. It's in a mess. And this is just one thing. But there was, uh, what was it, about six, how many million dollars for that bond that we were looking at? Not fast. You, you remember? It didn't come over to us. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Uh, in, in the house, we, we were looking at it was going to be four or five hundred million dollars. And just under five hundred. Yeah, I, I think it was under five hundred million. It, it would be a bond bill, and that bond would those bonds would be floated, and it would go to fixing these things that it's going to take large sums of money to fix uh, in many schools, and so that's one thing we have to look at. Uh, and Aiken Tech, the tech schools were in there, but, but it's, it's a chunk of money. And, and none of these schools have a chunk of money they can go spend four or five million dollars on the Pendulum building or whatever it's going to cost. It's got an air conditioning system. The roof's got to be torn off of that building to take the HVA system out of it. Because when it was built, it was built around it. So it, it's money that these schools need and they don't have. And so when people look at media, I'll use me as an example, they say, well, we don't want to raise taxes, we, we don't want to have a credit card bill or anything out there, but somehow, way in shape or form, we've got to fix these buildings. Because all of us try to do maintenance on our house. If we've got a leak in our roof, we try to fix it. But if you don't have the money to fix it, like some of these schools do, it just completely keeps deteriorating more from that. And so, if we look at the bond bill, please know that, you know, we're, the three of us aren't tax and spend senators and house members. We're trying to do what's best for our schools and what's best for our buildings. And the only way they're going to catch up, we believe, unless somebody can show us different, is going to, we're going to have to do a bond bill. It's me. So I'm just telling you that if you hear about a bond bill, this money will go directly to them. It's not going to be spent on wild and crazy stuff. It's going to be on repairs, maintenance, and upkeep of these buildings. So I want to tell you what a bond bill is. Some of the local issues that we've been involved in as a delegation are the Jackson boat landing. And many of you maybe have used the Jackson boat landing if you go out on the Savannah River. It's the only boat landing south of, uh, that's public, south of North Augusta, between North Augusta and Allendale County. And it needed a lot of work. And our delegation um, worked as a, as a collectively as a group to locate the funding and approve the funding that got used to re basically rebuild the boat landing. Um, I-20 bridges and widening project. I think everybody in here is probably familiar with that. All four bridges that are over the I-20, I mean over Savannah River and the canal, will be rebuilt and widened to six lanes coming into um, um, South Carolina um, to exit one. And we are still talking with the DOT, working with DOT, trying to figure out a way that we can widen it from uh, six lanes from exit one to exit five. Um, so they we're still working on that. We've been working on the ice store money reimbursement now for three years in the General Assembly. We got some more money this year. Five million dollars was allocated to the ice store counties, 22 of them. Aiken was the one that was hit worst. The city of North Augusta, Aiken County, the city of Aiken, and other municipalities. In our Thanks, senators, for putting that in because they didn't, we didn't put it in in the House. They didn't, they didn't. Thank y'all. We'll get some money. 
Um, all three of us are on the Petroleum Pipeline Eminent Domain Study Committee. I know there's some folks here today that are interested in that issue. We're, we're very involved in that. And then if you're familiar with the gas weather normalization adjustment that SCNG uses on your bill in the wintertime, our legislative delegation in Aiken County collectively wrote a letter to the Office of Regulatory <coughs> Staff last spring. We requested an audit of that. The audit is supposed to be done by September 1st, and we'll find out what the findings are on the audit hopefully sometime in the next three weeks. So I don't know what, if, Terry, if we have time for more questions. I mean, we're here ready to take questions. You could, if you have questions, give us your name and your list before you ask your questions. You stretch it, you got to Just a, I'm not a financial guy. I'll be the first to admit that, but most of the, uh, Pension fund, you see, reduced it to a like a seven or quarter percent rate return. Why not just follow this and see? That, that just seems artificial. I'm glad to answer that. I mean, I admit that. Um, I didn't vote for the bill at the end of the day because that was one reason, and um, I didn't think the, the rate of return was was realistic. The lower your low, the lower the rate of return the higher your unfunded liability. And so um, the seven and a quarter number was what was compromised on in the full committee, as I understand it, and then in the legislation that came through the House and the Senate. Um, there was also a provision in the original bill that passed the Senate that said that once the um, system is fully funded, that we would automatically switch from a defined um, benefit to a defined contribution system. Um, and they anticipated that would be in excess probably t 20 years out. And in the conference committee, that, that, that portion was taken out. And so when the conference report came back, I didn't vote for it. That was another reason why I didn't vote for it. And I was one of a few. But um, um, anyway, I, I felt like I should answer that since I, that was one of the reasons that I had identified. I thought it was a problem. We agree. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. I saw an article in the paper the other day where BC uh, SCG withdrew their request to abandon the BC summer plant, but did not commit to recommencing operations. So it seemed like a political move to me. Um, I know if y'all shot some high on what uh, withdrawal from abandonment to them. So that the, the application that they filed, and, and, and Everybody probably gets this, but standard SCNGs are regulated monopoly, right? So they can't really do anything without approval from the Public Service Commission. They filed an application with the Public Service Commission for a finding that their abandonment was a prudent decision. Prudent is a term of art, right? That's a, and, and that's a big deal because if they get that finding, then everything else, the rate increases and everything else that follow are pretty much a gift. If it's prudent for them to abandon, they get all sorts of things as a result of that. Now, it was partly political, and the reason is because we've been beating the hell out of them for the last two weeks, telling them they need to withdraw the obligation. Right? And in all candor, if they hadn't done it, we were going to come back and do it for them. Uh, but what, what we convinced them was, was this. This is a very complicated area. You've got to give us time to figure out what in the world happened, how we got here, and how we're going to move forward without having this gun to our head that we're going to have a 60-year rate increase for those. Right? I mean, we've got to have time to figure this stuff out. Y'all have to have time to understand what's happened without getting a 60-year rate increase locked in on it. So what they agreed to do was they would draw it for now, let us do what we've got to do, and then we'll see how this legislative process works out. Um, now, they're looking at a total amount of around $5 billion that they lost. And they want to use the legislation allows them to recoup that. Right? So what, they've, what, they're, what they propose to do would be to raise rates to some degree, spread it out over a 60-year period in order to, to recoup those losses. Um, we've asked them, hold off on that for now. Let us figure out what's going on. Let everybody figure out what's going on before we have any type of rate increases. And they've agreed to do that. 
And so I, I think I think that was a good thing. I mean, it was partly political, but really it was, it was a good business move, honestly. They, they needed to show you that they were listening to you. Um, and they also needed to let everybody have an opportunity to figure out what happened before we really get in, into that point. So, yeah. Um, since I'm going to be on this committee that uh, you know, dig into them from this county and, and the San Francisco, uh, I've been in the house since 2010. Uh, over that period of time, Scanlon has donated money to my campaign and also to co-ops. Uh, it was $2,000 from Scanlon and $2,000 from the co-ops. I last week wrote a check back to Scanlon for $2,000 and also the co-op, $2,000. I called each one of them, uh, CEO, not CEO, but the people that have given me the checks from me, they were packed, and told them that I was sending my money back. They told me that I didn't have to do that. I thought it was prudent in my mind that if I'm going to be up there making a decision about those two companies, that I didn't want to be obligated to anybody, and that little amount of money wasn't going to obligate me to them anyway. But for the public perception, I gave my money back. So each one of them got their money back. And I look forward to sitting there and seeing what they've done uh, and what we're going to be able to do, because I, I have two bills. I get South Carolina electric and gas at my office, and I get Aiken Electric Co-op at my home. So I pay two ways. So when I sit there, I'm going to be able to look at it with an open mind. I'm not obligated to anybody except the people that in House Sister Gate 3 in the state of South Carolina. So I just want to let you know what I did. Let me, let, me, let me add something to this discussion real quick. Our legislative delegation, the county, Aiken County legislative delegation, the last two years has sponsored at the State House a state of nuclear presentation in which the Citizens for Nuclear Technology Awareness, Mr. Bridges, um, that group, along with SRNS and SRR and um, um, SCNG and Westinghouse and several other companies at Duke Energy that have a um, nuclear presence in the state come and give a presentation. Well, this year, it was on January the 28th, and several of our delegation members were present. During the SCNG presentation, we asked the question, what if Toshiba files for bankruptcy? What is your contingency plan as to BC summer? The answer was they had a plan that 90% of the material was already on the um, um, site and that they would be, they felt confident they'd be able to finish the project. That's in the February the 11th Post and Courier Charleston newspaper if you want to go back and look at the article. I'll just say on, on this, on uh, this point, just to kind of wrap this up for, for me anyway, is that there's a lot of questions. I know y'all got questions. We've got a lot of questions. I think we've got to have an opportunity. We've got to have time to, to ask those questions and to get some answers. Um, and, and I think we're committed to holding people accountable at that point. But it's going to take a little while to get through that process because, again, this is a pretty complicated area. Uh, I mean, you know, we could probably make some snap judgments about who's at fault. We might, get, we might be right, we might be wrong. But, but I think as long as we don't have that gun to our head anymore, I think we've got a little bit of time to figure these things out, and we'll get to it. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, it would be BC Summer, and I think that was a long time coming with Westinghouse, but you guys mentioned at the beginning you, guys, you were not around when they decided that the increase in energy was needed for South Carolina, that, that ratio that allowed the vocal or the, excuse me, the BC summer plant to come on. So I'm wondering if you think the Public Service Commission or if the legislative body will begin asking for a comprehensive energy plan for South Carolina so that we don't have, I, I expect natural gas will try and fill the BC summer void and that, that growth of looking at how much power do we actually need in South Carolina so that we don't get ourselves in the same situation because we currently don't have that in place. I know that the senator and I were just talking. Uh, that would be one of the things that we'll be looking into uh, to see how much power we need. Just to, to take in mind, back in 2007, 2008, when when this passed, again, none of us were there. Thank God, we don't, none of us were there. Um, they based what they were doing on facts and figures of those days' times. So facts and figures of those days' times, you had all prices rising. You had it was no coal gas prices were rising, so they looked at every kind of way to be able to produce power. Since 2007, 2008, a lot has changed. 
And so now we need to put today's factors in place and look at those and see what is going to be best uh, for us in South Carolina and, and, and all, all of the rate payers. But again, we're going to be looking at it at 2017, 2018, 2020 ideas instead of 2007 and 2008. So, you know, you, you have to look at it with what figures, in fact, you got in front of you right then. And so that's what they did and, and that's what they thought was best to do then. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Thank you all very, very much.